Well, it's good to be here with you guys tonight, and uh, got a couple of quick announcements. So we got, well, I was going to say, we, we managed this up, it was really good last night, but uh, this Friday morning at uh, 10 o'clock, the women are going to have their women's discipleship uh, brunch time, and so ladies are all invited to that. And then uh, Sunday, we're going to have community together in the morning. The single women's fellowship dinner is coming up uh, another week, couple of weeks, I guess. And then uh, the men's breakfast is coming up on the 27th. Also, we're having a memorial uh, for Jack Glendon. Uh, that'll be on Saturday, uh, the 27th as well at 1 o'clock, and everyone's invited to that. And then uh, the women's conference is coming up. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is now officially kicked off. And let's pray. Father God, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to worship you and to study your word. And we ask that you would guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're able, let's stand together and uh, worship. this song one time. It's an old, old song. We've never sang it here. The worship team has practiced it one time. So let's see if we can get through this. Worship our God. The words are pretty good. Real good. I like it. Here we go. First one.
ourselves and elsewhere. Here we go. How Gracious Father, thank you for bringing us here tonight, Lord. There's no place we'd rather be than just to be sitting at your feet and hearing your voice, Lord, and learning how to be yielded to you. We love you so much, Lord, but we thank you for loving us. Guide us this evening, Father. Be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, welcome, you guys. Why don't you turn and say hello to each other real quick. Well, tonight we're going to be in uh, Jeremiah chapter 13 as we continue in our trek through this, uh, this prophetic book. We'll, uh, we'll read the chapter together, then we'll go back and we'll study it through. So uh, uh, once you get your Bibles open, if you're able, would you stand with me uh, in reverence for God's word as we read it together? Jeremiah chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, it says... Thus the Lord said to me, Go and get yourself a linen sash, and put it around your waist, but do not put water in it. Uh, so I got a sash according to the word of the Lord, and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time, saying, Take the sash that you acquired, which is around your waist, and arise and go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole in the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. Now it came to pass, after many days, that the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the sass which I commanded you to hide there. So I went to the Euphrates, dug up <coughs> and dug, and I took the sash from the place where I had hidden it, and there was the sash ruined. Uh, it was profitable for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, In this manner I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. Uh, this evil people who refuse to hear my words who follow the dictates of their hearts and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be just like this sash, which is profitable for nothing. For as the sash clings to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to cling to me, says the Lord, that they may become my people for renown, for praise, for glory. Uh, but they would not hear. 
Therefore you shall speak to them this word. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Every bottle shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, Do we not certainly know that every bottle will be filled with wine? Then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, with drunkenness. And I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, says the Lord. I will not pity nor spare, nor have mercy, but will destroy them. Hear and give ear. Do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the the Lord your God before he causes darkness and before your feet stumble on the dark mountains. And while you are looking uh, for light, he turns it into a shadow of death and makes it dense darkness. But if you will not hear it, uh, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Say to the king and to the queen mother, humble yourselves, sit down. For your rule shall collapse the crown of your glory. The cities of the south shall be shut up, and no one shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. Lift up your eyes and see. Those who come from the north, uh, where is the flock that was given to you, uh, your beautiful sheep? Uh, What will you say when he punishes you? Uh, You've you've taught them to be chieftains, to be head over you. Uh, Will not pangs seize you like a woman in labor? And if you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me for the greatness of your iniquity? Your skirts have been uncovered and your heels made bare. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Uh, Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Therefore, I will scatter them like stubble that passes away by the wind of the wilderness. This is your lot, the portion of, of your measures from me, says the Lord, because you've forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. Therefore, I will uncover your skirts over your face, uh, that your shame may appear. I have seen your adulteries and your lustful names, uh, the lewdness of your harlotry, your abominations on the hills and in the fields. Uh, woe to you, O Jerusalem, will you still not be made clean? Gracious Father, we, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this warning. Lord, we ask that you would help us to take heed, to understand, Lord, how to apply these things to our lives, and that Truly, Lord, you would, you would instruct us tonight. Guide us, Father, by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You guys can be seated. <clears throat> well, here in verse 1, uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, Thus the Lord said to me, Go and get yourself a linen sash, put it around your waist, and do not put water in it. So I got a sash according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And so, again, the Lord speaks to Jeremiah. He's about to use uh, a very practical illustration, not quite a parable, uh, but an illustration to once again illustrate or demonstrate the nation's need to hear the word of God and to repent of their sins. Uh, In that day, pretty much everybody wore these kind of like long robes, and they fit pretty loosely around the body. And uh, they would take a a sash or, or a rope Sometimes the sashes can be very ornate, colorful, decorative, or very simple, you know, just like a a, a rope wrapped like a belt, you know, around your waist to draw the the robe in so that you can move easier and and not necessarily catch on everything or whatever. Um, It kind of functioned as a a belt. Uh, You've probably heard that phrase before uh, or read it, you know, gird up your loins. And what that meant was when particularly a man would be wearing one of these long robes with a sash around it. Uh, when he was going to go to work, he would hike the, 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 the skirt up, if you will, or the hem up or the bottom of it, so that it was like around his knees or so, and then tie it off with the sash, and he could run or, or fight or, or work or, or do whatever he had to do. And so uh, that's pretty much what uh, it was used for. Now, it's interesting, <clears throat> the word sash is also translated as, quote-unquote, girdle, Okay. And, uh, and Jeremiah is told to get one of these sashes slash, I think in King James it says girdle, and, um, and wear it. You know, people are supposed to be able to see it. Uh, there's a couple commentators that claim that the girdle was more like undergarments. And so, you know, if he goes and gets this uh, gir- girdle slash undergarment, no one's going to see it, right, because it's underneath the robe. And so the idea is that people will see the, the lesson. So I do believe it was a sash on the outside of his clothing. Uh, so the sash was very practical, very common. 
Uh, most people in that day, they wore uh, woolen or wool robes uh, because that's what they had. They had sheep and goats, and that's what they made wool from, and so it was very, very common. Uh, linen was considered kind of a, a luxury item. It was also one of those things that was used uh, for the priestly garments because um, in Exodus uh, chapter 28, uh, it describes the making of the priestly garments or to be made of finely twined uh, linen or cotton. And the idea was that it was a cooler uh, type of material. Uh, the priests, when they were performing their functions, uh, were not supposed to sweat. Uh, literally, I, I don't know how they avoided that in Israel in the summer, uh, but the idea was they weren't supposed to sweat because serving the Lord is supposed to be easy and cool and a real joy. You know, it's the opposite of the heavy religious burdens uh, that people would put upon one another at times. Uh, and, and so the idea was that the, the linen sash was representing, in a sense, just that. Uh, Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew eleven twenty eight and forward, he said, Come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, our relationship with God isn't supposed to be a heavy religious weight or a burden, but just the opposite. It's to be liberating, light, and, and free. Uh, you know, it's, it's to be a joy. And so uh, the linen uh, sash, if you will, um, he's told not to put it in water, uh, which I think means not to wash it. Uh, and we'll see where that comes into play later on. But uh, he goes out and gets a linen sash. He puts it on. He wears it around. Uh, so that the people of Judah and Jerusalem can see it, uh, it's to be a visible lesson. And so it wouldn't do any good if it was concealed under his garments. Uh, people are intended to see it and then draw some lesson or conclusion uh, from it as we move on. Uh, in verse 3 it says, And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, Take the sash that you have acquired, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. Uh, verse 5, so I went and hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. And so uh, he's instructed to take the sash and stash it by the river Euphrates. And I have to admit, I've read this a few times and just kind of said, oh, yeah, just go to the Euphrates. Kind of like go to the Jordan River or go you know, across the street. Uh, but you think about it, when he says uh, go to the Euphrates, uh, he's talking about a significant trip. Um, the Euphrates River, it's called uh, Pirath in Hebrew. He's supposed to take it to a hole in the rock. But if you look up on the screen, I put a picture of the, the Babylonian Empire. And uh, the river Euphrates, well, pop, there we go, the, the big blue line that I just put right there. Jerusalem is over here uh, in Israel. And I measured uh, on the map the, the closest point uh, as the crow flies. You know, he didn't walk as the crow flies, but I mean, you know, the, the, the closest point point on the map to the Euphrates from Jerusalem is roughly 400 miles. So it's not like, hey, uh, you know, don't wait up for me. I'll be home to, you know, after dinner. <laughs> uh, this is like a, a, a month-long trip. I'm not sure what it is walking because he's walking. And so uh, Jeremiah, he's not just the weeping prophet. He's the walking prophet. And he's about to get his cardio. But um, anyway, the Euphrates River starts at the very top up here uh, in Mesopotamia. And it cruises all the way down uh, through the center of Babylon, then on into the Persian Gulf. And so we're not told what part of the Euphrates he went to. I kind of halfway assume it was somewhere near Babylon, just because that's where the children of Israel were going to be taken eventually. But we don't really know. I'm just kind of, you know, uh, throwing it out there. But it's a 400-mile trip uh, at the minimum on foot. And then in verse 6, uh, he says, Now it came to pass many days. Uh, after many days, that the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the sash, which I commanded you to hide there. Notice his obedience. He's told to take, you know, get a sash, he gets a sash. He, he wears it around for a while, and then he's told, okay, now take it 400 miles away and stash it, you know, uh, in this very specific kind of a place. And so he, he does that. And then uh, some time goes by, we're not sure how long, could have been a year, we don't know. Uh, and then he's told, okay, now go back and get it and bring it back. And so he's up and back, uh, up and back. And so at minimum, that's 1,200 miles, maybe more, of walking uh, within that span of time. And so uh, 
he's got nicely toned uh, legs. But, uh, <laughs> um, but by this time, uh, the sash was probably, it was ruined. Uh, it, it, it's not good for anything. Maybe the water got to it. Maybe just being buried messed it up. Uh, either way now, it, it, it's, not, it's not good for anything. And so the, the sash becomes just uh, a filthy rag, if you will, which, by the way, is how God sees uh, our righteousness. Uh, Isaiah describes in Isaiah 64, verse 6, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And I think this is where the, the don't put it in water statement from um, verse 1 kind of comes into play. Don't put it in water. Um, don't wash it, I guess would be one way to put it. And what it boils down to is we can't clean up our own act. Uh, we come as we are, and then he cleans us up. Uh, this whole thing would have been a lot more convenient uh, if he said, hey, just take it over the Jordan River and bury it, and I'll let you know when to go get it. Uh, nothing about our faith is particularly convenient. Uh, it's not intended to be. Uh, but um, um, uh, our faith is not always, again, a convenient faith. Uh, Paul talks about vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Uh, and I think in some way, uh, some ways this ruined sash uh, represents our lives. Uh, we're useful when we're wrapped around the wearer, uh, you know, abiding in him, if you will. Uh, but in our sinful state, we are altogether uh, useless and, and ruined. And, and Paul states as much. In Romans chapter 7, verse 18, Paul says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. You know, we'd like to think that there's some little part of us that's good. Uh, but if you think that, you do not understand the depravity of man, uh, that we are completely depraved. Uh, and I won't go into depths on that. Uh, but like Paul said, there, there's nothing good in me except for our, my Lord Jesus. Um, in fact, where Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 17, verse 10, he says, so likewise, when you've done all those things which you're commanded to do, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. And so if anything good comes from our life, it's him. If anything you know, good is in us, it's him. Uh, it, it's certainly not us. But in verse 8, we see that... Uh, then the word of the Lord came to, to me saying, and as Jeremiah is obedient uh, to the first part, uh, he's told what the next thing is. You know, he, he, he's not given the whole plan. Hey, I'm going to have you go back and forth to uh, the Euphrates a couple times. I'm going to have you do this and that, you know, and, and lay the whole thing out. He's getting it step by step by step. And as he's obedient to do the first thing that he knows to do, he completes that task, if you will. Then he's told the next thing. And then he's told the next thing. And so what I'm kind of getting at is that oftentimes hearing the voice of the Lord is based on obedience to the word that we've already received. You know, if we've been told something, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, Pastor, I'm having a hard time. I don't feel like I'm hearing, you know, the voice of God anymore. And my first question is, well, what was the last thing he told you? What was the last thing he instructed you to do? You know, did you do that? And, uh, and a lot of times just no. And I say, well, ask God to forgive you and to give you a second chance you know, at, at doing that. And then whatever he tells you to do, do it. <laughs> do it with all your heart, you know, but that's how you kind of keep hearing uh, from God. Anyway, in verse 9, uh, it says, uh, thus says the Lord, in this manner I will ruin the pride of Judah and, and the great pride of Jerusalem. So in the same way that the sash was removed from his waist, uh, no longer abiding on him, and then taken to the Euphrates, essentially to Babylon, and hidden in the rock, uh, and I would say the rock represents a fortress or a jail or their captivity, uh, so he will deal with slash ruin the pride of Judah and Jerusalem. He, he's taken something that's useful, something that's probably uh, good looking or whatever, and it's been stashed and buried now for a, a set time in a set place. He didn't say a rock, he said to the rock. And so there's a specific location that God's got in mind that Jeremiah goes to, he goes back and retrieves it, and now it's repugnant. Uh, now it's ruined, and now it's, it's not good for anything. And, and honestly, uh, that represents uh, our lives and certainly the lives of the people of Jerusalem in that day. But um, he says he's going to ruin the pride of Judah and the, the great pride of Jerusalem. And, you know, we're told in, uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, that pride goes before destruction 
and a haughty spirit before a fall. And pride is the root cause that leads to so many other sins. And so it's their pride that's dragging them down. Uh, in verse 10, this evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their hearts and walk after other gods uh, to serve them and worship them, shall be just like this sass, which is profitable for nothing. And so we're told here this evil people, uh, why are they evil? Number one, because they refuse to hear the word of God. Uh, that's, that's God's definition, not necessarily mine, but, uh, but it's so true. They refuse to hear the word of God because in their pride they think they know better. And a verse from, uh, from Proverbs again, from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, we're admonished, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. I think one of the, the, the lessons we learn along the way to salvation is that we're not as slick as we thought we were. You know, we're not as wise or as intelligent. We don't have it together. You know, you just look at the, the fruit, the result of our lives, you're going, hmm, I think I need to do something different. And, uh, and the hardest thing for people to accept, uh, and I'm thinking about someone that I love very much that uh, has everything in life, you would think, but they're miserable. And they keep doing it the same way and expecting a different result. And, uh, and sometimes you just got to be willing to change. Um, but like, like Solomon says, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. But sadly, this people, they're doing exactly the opposite. They're following the dictates of their own hearts which is a classic and tragic mistake. Uh, we're told later on in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't even know our own hearts. I'll be honest with you. You know, I thought I was a pretty good guy until I read the Bible. You know, I start reading the Bible and I realize, man, what's my motive behind this? Or what's my reason for that? Or, you know, the, it's that double-edged sword that gets between the joints and the marrow and the thoughts, the intents of the heart and reveals really to, to us who we are, uh, the things that God knew all along, but the heart is so deceitful. We're told in Proverbs uh, chapter 28, verse 26, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. I don't hear it as much as I used to because I think too many people have heard my sermons on it, but uh, I used to hear all the time from people would say, well, you know, God knows my heart. And I'd always turn, I could, I'd turn into this verse and make them read it. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you know your heart, all right. You know, but uh, do you know your heart? And we're told to keep our hearts. Uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, we're told, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And so, obviously, we've got the ability to keep our heart. But here, the, 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 the reason for these things is they are rejecting God's word. They're following the dictates of their own hearts. They're worshiping idols. And they've become useless and unprofitable, unfruitful. Uh, just like the sash uh, that Jeremiah brought back from uh, the river Euphrates. Uh, in verse 11, For as the sash clings to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to cling to me, says the Lord, that they may become my people for renown, for praise, and for glory, but they would not hear. You know, his intent was that they would cling to him, that they would, you know, abide with him, that, that they would be for renown, for the, the fame and the glory and all those different things that God would get. Uh, but it says here that they wouldn't listen. Uh, Jeremiah is commanded to retrieve the sash and, and likely brought it back to Jerusalem and wore it around so people could once again observe it and, and learn the intended lesson. Uh, but as it says here, and they would not hear. Uh, there are those who receive the word of God and the result of that, which I believe is salvation because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But those that have ears to hear, hear. Those that don't have ears to hear, don't, sadly. And, uh, and they don't even know what they're missing. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Later on in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. That's what I want. That's the heart that I want. I want to receive God's word with all readiness of mind and then be willing to search it out 
and, and know it because you know God's taught it to me, not because I nodded my head and said, yeah, that's it. But there's also the wrong reaction, sadly, uh, rejecting or despising God's word. You know, by the way, when I say rejecting, I don't have to say despising because it's implied. We reject God's word at times because we despise God's word and, uh, and, and vice versa. And so we're told in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13, uh, he who despises the word will be destroyed. And that's sad because those that despise the word of God end up not being saved. Uh, and, and those that aren't saved end up sadly, you know, in hell. And so <clears throat> those who despise the word will be destroyed. God's desire is that they would cling to him, abide in him, that they would be his people uh, for renown, for praise, and for glory. These are all things, by the way, that belong to God, exclusively uh, to God. The prophet Isaiah tells us in uh, Isaiah 42, verse 8, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will, I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. He is a jealous God, and those things belong to him. But they refuse to hear, sadly uh, despising and rejecting uh, his word. Then we see the result of that in verses 12 and 13. It says, Therefore you shall speak to them this word. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Every bottle shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, uh, Do we not certainly know that every bottle will be filled with wine? And then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. And we see this is a, uh, almost a, this, this drunkenness, uh, this lack of sobriety is actually a judgment uh, from God. And they're going to be given over to drunkenness in rejecting the prophecy of Jeremiah, the word of God uh, to the nation. Uh, they said they're not going to be conquered. They're not going to suffer. Uh, every bottle will be filled with wine, with merriment, with joy, with celebration, with blessing. I mean, wine oftentimes is indicative of the, the, the blessings of God, you know, the, the fruitfulness of the vine, if you will. And so they're saying, yeah, you know, our bottles are going to be full. Uh, and they're thinking one kind of wine, uh, the, the fruit of the vine, if you will. Uh, but I think that God is thinking of something else entirely. Uh, later on in Jeremiah 25, uh, verse 15, we read, For thus says the Lord God of Israel uh, to me, Take this, this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations whom I send to you to drink it. And so they're thinking they're going to they're, they're gonna have a party drinking the, the fruit of the vine that's going to fill that bottle up. God's saying, no, I'm going to fill the bottle up with wine, but it's, it's going to be the wine of the fury of my wrath. Um, uh, later on, much later on, actually, in Revelation uh, chapter 14, verse 10, uh, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Uh, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And so when, when God fills up this cup of the, the, the fierceness of his wrath, nobody wants to drink that. Nobody wants a taste of that. And so these kings, uh, the priests and the prophets and all the inhabitants will be given over to wine uh, they won't be in their right minds. And this literally, literally is a judgment uh, from God. In fact, it, you know, I'm not going to rail on uh, alcohol consumption, uh, which I could so easily do, uh, but I will not. I'll just give you a couple of verses that uh, let God rail on it for a minute. Uh, in Isaiah 28, verse 7, it says, uh, But they also have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink and are out of the way. Uh, the priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision and they stumble in judgment. And it's a, it's a sad thing when their leaders of our county uh, are encouraging just that uh, through the use of marijuana and, uh, and whatever else. And it's, just, it's grievous. Uh, we're told in Proverbs chapter 31, uh, verses 4 and 5, uh, it's not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, uh, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. And so there is uh, a negative consequence to all this. Interesting to note, I, it's not true today as it once was, <coughs> but you can look up on the internet and see the cities that have 
uh, the highest per capita alcohol consumption. And uh, seven out of 12 right now are in Wisconsin, which I didn't quite figure out. But a while back when I looked it up, it was actually Washington, D.C. I had, uh, they were like in the top three uh, for alcohol consumption. And it's like, wow, you know, uh, the, the State Department and our government um, um, entities actually purchase a lot of alcohol. And, uh, and so many of the deal, wheeling and dealing is done over alcohol, which is, uh, you can see why we're so awesome uh, <laughs> in our legislation. But uh, anyway, verse 14, and he says, and I will dash them one against the other, uh, even the fathers and the sons together, says the Lord. I will not pity nor spare nor have mercy, but will destroy them. And so he's going to dash them against each other. As it says, he will not pity or spare or have mercy, but he's going to destroy them. And all the things that he's known for, he's, he's a God that pities his children. He is a merciful God. He is a gracious God. He's a kind God. He's a loving God. And, 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 and so he's known for those things, and, and they are true of him. But you know what? He's also holy. He is also righteous. And his righteousness demands uh, that things be made right, you know, at some point. And, and now they will experience, sadly, the wrath and the judgment of God. And just like the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, when it's time for that chastening, when it's time for that, that judgment to fall, it's a terrible, fearful thing. But then he says in verse 15, uh, Hear and give ear, do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. And so hear, give ear. Jesus said this many times uh, in different places, but in Matthew 13, 9, he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And my prayer for me, uh, my prayer for us as a fellowship, and for those listening on the radio and watching on the internet, is that truly we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive, a willingness to apply God's word to our lives and to allow God's word to be the final authority in our lives. Why? For the Lord has spoken. That's authority right there. It, it, it's God speaks and we jump. You know, God speaks honestly and we tremble. Um, in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 32, Now therefore listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. I want the blessing. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you straight up, I want the blessing. But I want, I, want to, I want to please my Father. In verse 16, it says, Give glory to the Lord your God before he causes darkness and before your feet stumble uh, on the mountains. And, and while you are looking for light, he turns it into the shadow of death and makes it a dense darkness. You know, we're walking in the light right now, but there's a coming time when he's going to turn the lights out. And, uh, and, and he's describing this group of people that are walking in a very dangerous path. You know, God is glorified uh, in our obedience at our taking him at his word and submitting to his authority, making him literally, like I said, the final authority in our lives, giving him lordship. A lot of times we describe our Lord Jesus as, quote, unquote, our, our Lord Jesus uh, or Lord and Savior. And I know that for the first portion of my Christian walk, I was much more focused on the Savior part, that he was my Savior. He saved me from hell. I'm good. And then over time, and as I began to get into his word and, and to get a little more grounded, I realized, hold it, there's, there's, a, there's a, a balance here where he's got to be both. He is our Savior, yes, but he's also got to be our Lord, where he does have sway in our life, where he does have authority in our life, that he can redirect us, that he can uh, chasten us or challenge us or teach us, all these different things. Uh, that's all part of lordship, submitting to him. And so the lordship part, having authority in our lives. But he says, give glory to God before it's too late. And he causes your feet to stumble on that slippery slope that you're already walking on. You know, um, the way of an unbeliever, I mean, I know Asaph complained, hey, the, the, these non-believers are being blessed and I'm being hammered. You know, they, they've got an easy life and I'm having a hard life. But, you know, you, you look at the majority of, quote, unquote, non-believers, 
their lives aren't all that easy either. I don't know how they cope with all the junk that's going on in our culture. I don't know how I would cope with, with the things I'm seeing and understanding if I didn't have Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If I didn't understand that we have the hope of heaven and being with him. That sustains me. That keeps me going. That, that peace of God that surpasses all understanding that the world in general doesn't have. And it, it, it's amazing how hard life can be when you don't know the Lord. Unnecessarily so, I might add. We read in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 19, it says, The way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. The way of the non-believer is tough, man. You've got to push through, push through a hedge of thorns. Uh, but the, the, the way of the righteous is an easy way. We read later on, actually we already read it, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. We need God to guide us. The psalmist says the same thing in Psalm 37, verse 23. He says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. So my prayer is, Lord, help order our steps for us. He's, Jeremiah is describing a group of people that are on a very dangerous path, and literally they're walking in darkness, and God is offering them light. The, the psalmist declares in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God wants us to walk in the light as children of the light. He doesn't want us to walk in darkness. And that's where you get hurt. I know whenever I've walked in darkness, I mean, uh, physical darkness, like, you know, I've been on uh, hiking trails. I've gone through my backyard. I've been in my house. And when the lights aren't on, I seem to hit stuff. <laughs> you know, my toes, you know, walking by Braille is a hard way to go, you know, and, and turn the lights on. Uh, and even though they've gone so far, this is, to me, this is one of the, again, the amazing thing about reading through the, the prophets Isaiah and now Jeremiah is that even though they've gone so far, God is still holding his hand out to them. He is offering them a chance if they'll just take it. He says, give glory to the Lord your God before he causes darkness. You know, underline that word before. That is another chance. Why, why does he keep offering another chance? Because, as it says in 2 Peter, the Lord, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His desire is that we would have fellowship with him, that we would commune with him that we would never be separated from him. And that's what sin has done, but that can be fixed. In verse 17, But if you will not hear it, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears, because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. And so he's saying, if you don't hear, if you don't listen, then I'll grieve for you, because the Lord's flock, Israel, Judah, has been taken captive. You know, Jeremiah is known uh, as the weeping prophet. His heart really is for the people. He understands what's going to happen to them because of their disobedience, and it grieves him. I mean, if he'd been a lesser man, he'd be going, <laughs> you got that coming, you know, kind of like probably what I would do, <laughs> told you so, you know. Uh, that's why uh, you don't read about the prophecy of Mike in this Bible, you know, because it would, it would be like a you know, <laughs> hammer time or something. But, but Jeremiah... He, he is grieving for them. And, and, and pretty much, I think, the way reflecting the heart of our Lord Jesus. You remember when Jesus was uh, coming over the Mount of Olives on the, on the uh, triumphant entry? And, and as he got into or got towards Jerusalem, uh, he began to weep over the city. In uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, verse 40, when it says, Now as he drew near, uh, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you'd known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus knew the repercussions of their choice, and that they were going to be destroyed, essentially. And Jesus wept for them, uh, just like Jeremiah is weeping for the people in his day, because he, he knows what's at stake. Jesus wept because of their blindness, their ignorance, their refusal, uh, rejecting him, rejecting God's word. 
And I kind of wonder what he's thinking about where we are today. You know, we as a nation, uh, we as a, a people on the planet, you know, the church, all those things. What must he think as he watches the church today, as he watches the world, uh, the, the Christ-rejecting world, uh, behave just like that? Uh, in verse 18, he says, Say to the king and the queen mother, uh, humble yourselves, sit down, uh, for your rule shall collapse uh, the crown of your glory. So say to them, give them godly counsel, and his counsel is, humble yourselves. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Yield. You know, sometimes it's the hardest thing for a person to do, is to just yield to the Lord. Their pride will be their end. Now, at this point in this prophecy, I'm not absolutely sure uh, which of the kings is on the throne, uh, whom uh, Jeremiah would be prophesying to or correcting or rebuking. But in, uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, it lists uh, the last kings of Judah. And after Josiah was killed in battle, uh, his son Jehoahaz, uh, who was 23 years old when he began to reign. He only reigned for three months, and then he was taken out. Uh, then after him uh, was Jehoiakim, uh, who was 25 years old uh, when he began to reign. He reigned for 11 years, and then uh, he was uh, taken out. And then Jehoiakim was uh, 18 when he reigned, and he only reigned for three months. He was the grandson of uh, uh, Josiah, but... Uh, his mother, uh, uh, Queen Nehushta, uh, and, and they're described in 2 Kings chapter 24, uh, uh, verse 20, 8, 8 through 20 actually. <clears throat> since, since Queen Nehushta, the queen mother, if you will, is described uh, along with uh, Jehoiakim, uh, I kind of assume that perhaps uh, it was during the, the reign of King Jehoiakim when Jeremiah offers up this particular prophecy because he says, say to the king and to the queen mother. Now, in, um, in Kings, I'm sorry, in uh, Chronicles, it says that Jehoiakim was eight years old. Uh, in uh, Second Kings, it says he was 18 years old. So there's, there might be a translational issue or typographical type of an error there. But uh, it also says in Kings that both uh, Jehoiakim and his mother were evil or did evil like their fathers. And so I'm assuming he was older, probably 18, uh, to do that. But the point is, is that the queen mother is still around as an influence. And she may have been around to influence all these kings, I don't know. Uh, the last king is Zedekiah, who was 21 when he began to reign. And, uh, and you know, he reigns for 11 years till he's uh, 32. And then he's uh, killed by the king of Babylon uh, or the king of... Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar kills him and, um, and his sons in front of him. And so it's a pretty sad, pretty sad affair. But because here in Jeremiah it says, say to the king and to the queen mother, well, the Nehushtan, Nehushta is the only one that's actually named as the queen mother, so that's why I kind of figure it's probably them. Um, and so, but in any event, they're told to humble themselves. Why are they told to humble themselves? Because they must have thought an awful lot of themselves. Uh, they were prideful in some way, and certainly in rejecting uh, the Word of God, they expressed that. But um, um, uh, I, I would say that she was probably a negative influence and it, it advised to humble herself as well as the king. And again, uh, pride is the root of so many sins. But in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2, uh, when pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. And they're told, uh, your rule shall collapse uh, the crown of your glory. And uh, it's not that their rule is just going to collapse. It's the way they rule. The manner of their rule is what's going to cause the collapse of, of the crown of their glory. Uh, they're going to reap, essentially, uh, what they've sown. And we read in Galatians chapter 6, uh, verses 7 and 8, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. 
And, you know, the question is asked in the narrative here at one point, you know, why is this happening to me? Which to me is like one of the most ridicul ridiculous questions in the entire book. Because as you go through this, he explains over and over again, you've rejected me, you've chased after idols, you've you know, committed harlotry, you've done this, you've done that, you've done the other thing. And, and over and over again, the prophet is describing what they're doing wrong and how to correct it. It's one thing to present a problem. It's one thing to say, hey, this is messed up. It's something else to have a course of correction and say, here's how you fix this, you know? And he's been doing that too. And so they're going to sadly reap what they've been sowing very hard. Uh, in, in verse 19, it says, the cities of the south shall be shut up and no one shall, call, uh, shall open them. Uh, Judah shall be carried away uh, uh, captive, all of it. Uh, it shall be wholly carried away captive. So describing the destruction and their eventual captivity. Uh, verse 20, he says, lift up your eyes and see uh, those who come from the north. Uh, where's the flock that was given to you? Your beautiful sheep. You know, where did everybody go? Um, but look and see that the Babylonians are coming from the north and they're sweeping the Israelites away on their way. You know, where did your sheep go? They've been consumed by the Babylonians. You know, they've been taken captive. Um, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to watch all this. But again, uh, they've been told this before. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 22, uh, Behold, the noise of the report has come, and a great commotion uh, out of the north country to make the cities of Judea desolate, uh, a den of jackals. And so when the Babylonians get done, it really is going to be scorched earth, and, uh, and they're going to be carried away captive uh, completely. Then in verse 21, he says, what will you say when uh, he punishes you? For you've taught them to be chieftains, to be head over you. Will not pangs seize you like a woman in labor? Um, you know, what will you say? What can you say? You know, they're not going to say, well, if we'd only known. Because Jeremiah and Isaiah and a, a bunch of other prophets have been telling them. You know, if, if we'd only been warned. I think they were warned a lot. You know, I mean, uh, when I was a cop, there would be times where we'd, ha we'd have these altercations, and, and we had actually a lot of them. And, uh, you know, you hear somebody in a fight, you'd, you'd get there as fast as you could to be part of it, to help them out and all that stuff. And, uh, but a lot of times you got there, and there's already too many guys, you know, um, involved in it where you, you couldn't be involved. And so what I did was I got up to the thing, and I saw what was going on, and I would turn around, and I'd start yelling, there'd be apartment buildings all around us. And I'd yell up to the apartment buildings, police officer, stop fighting, stop resisting. Police officer, please stop. Oh, please. And then when, then when the investigators came back later on, well, what happened? I don't know, but the cops kept yelling, please stop, submit to arrest. You know, please, pretty please. And uh, so it sounded pretty good. Anyway, uh, but, but what, what are they going to say? What can they say? They've been warned. You know, they've been told and told and told. And, and, and here's what they're going to say. It's, it's actually recorded for us in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 24. It says, howl ye, wail, you shepherds, and cry. That's what they're going to say. Roll about in the ashes, you leaders of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and your dispersions are fulfilled. You shall fall like a precious vessel. That, that phrase, you shall fall like a precious vessel. Every now and then in my kitchen, uh, actually my wife's kitchen, uh, I'll hear the sound of breaking glass. Somebody's putting a, a, a cup up or they're washing dishes, you know, the soap makes it slippery and it falls down and it's that unmistakable, you know, and the glass just shatters into 100 pieces, right? You ever been to a restaurant, you're eating your dinner and Somewhere in the back, a waitress drops a couple of glasses, and it's like, whoa, you know? It's like, that's what we're talking about. It, it, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the shattering of, you know, the glass there. And so um, <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll fall like a precious vessel. But then verse 22, again, is that question. And if you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? <laughs> uh, and then the answer's right there, too for the greatness of your iniquity. And uh, your skirts have been uncovered and your heels made bare. And so why? Uh, the greatness of your iniquity. 
Those that survive will have their skirts uncovered. In other words, they're going to be naked and barefoot. You know, they, um, they, they, they have their, 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 their pomp, their ceremony, their presence, uh, their, their nice jewelry, uh, nice clothes, all that kind of stuff. And these are all status symbols uh, for the people that he's talking about. But they're going, to be, they're going to be carried away naked and barefoot. You know, their shame's going to be exposed. Uh, verse 23, uh, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Uh, then may you also be do good uh, who are accustomed uh, to do evil. And so, great question. You know, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? We're born into this world as sinners. We are pre-wired uh, for sin. And that's something that we can't change. I try to I turned over new leaves all the time. I turned over new leaves all the time that I thought I was all rolled up, you know, and all these things. I, I kept trying to be good, and I could be good for almost 10 minutes, you know, or sometimes 10 days, and then I would go back to my old ways. And, um, you know, lots of people have tried, uh, but there's some things, there's, that's something we just can't change. We're pre-wired for sin. That's who we are. And, again, lots of people have tried you know, there's a program out there for about every, every human condition uh, or sin that you can think of, uh, you know, trying to change our spots. Uh, I've watched people pour thousands of dollars into uh, treatment programs uh, to get people off of drugs and watched it fail. Uh, as a culture and society, we have spent millions, if not billions of dollars to help people stop smoking, stop drinking, to lose weight, uh, to turn away from porn. And the list just kind of goes on and on and on of all the different treatment programs uh, that have out, been out there. People have tried, uh, but we are by nature what we are, sinners. And, uh, and, and people accustomed uh, to doing evil cannot change any more than an Ethiopian can change his skin color or a leopard uh, its spots. There's only one thing that can change us and has changed the lives of millions, and that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ taking God at his word, repenting of our sins, and allowing Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior. It takes being born again, allowing the old life to die, and being personally resurrected into a new life filled and led by the Holy Spirit of God. You know, that's the only thing that ever works. I, I worked with heroin addicts for years, and I watched, I watched one, one person in particular. They sank like over 100 grand uh, into this... Uh, a 17-year-old kid, and, uh, and got arrested over and over again. In fact, I arrested them several times. And, um, and I, I kept going to juvenile court and watching the whole process. And these parents that were doing everything they could, they, they mortgaged their home, literally, to pay for this kid, and nothing worked. I, I caught her the, the day after that trial. I caught her in an alley loaded uh, the next day. And, um, and I've, ne I've never seen any treatment program work except for our Lord Jesus. When people get hooked on Jesus and their lives change, it's dramatic. That's why I love going out to Team Challenge and watching these guys because they, have, they all have incredible testimonies. But the, the testimony of Jesus working in their hearts and their lives to change them, and, and that's how the, the, the leopard changes its spots, and that's how the Ethiopian skin changes, that they become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Truly, he who, sets the, sun, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. That's why Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Verse 24. Therefore, uh, I will scatter them like stubble. See, they haven't changed their skin. They haven't changed their spots. Therefore, I will scatter them like stubble uh, that passes away by the wind of the wilderness. And so they're going to be scattered like stubble as the wind blows. Uh, once a glorious, prosperous nation led by God, blessed abundantly, and now like the old song, they're just dust in the wind. You know, there's nothing good there. And, uh, and, and God's going to let them be blown away, if you will. Uh, in Psalm 1, verse 4, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. You know, the chaff is the, the byproduct of the wheat harvest. They would take the wheat, they would harvest it, they would, 
they would uh, winnow the wheat or, or grind it a little bit and all the chaff would fall off. Then they would, they would take the wheat and, and the chaff and they'd throw it up in the air. The wheat kernel being heavier would fall straight to the ground and then the chaff would blow away in the wind and no one ever thought about it again. And, and Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, uh, his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so <coughs> they are the chaff that's going to be blown away. Uh, in verse 25, uh, this is your lot, uh, the portion of your measures for me, says the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. I, uh, I, I underline like when it's a, a, a sinful thing or when God says what they did that was wrong, in my Bible, I underline that in orange. I don't know why, it's just kind of my little code. Orange means fire, okay? And, uh, and there's a lot of orange uh, on the pages of my Bible in this area because God keeps telling them over and over again what they've done, and that is they've rejected, uh, they've rejected his word. And back in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 13, he says, Because you've forsaken my law, which I, what I, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it. Again, it comes down to what do we do with uh, the word of God? Then in verse 26, therefore, I will uncover your skirts over your face that your shame may appear. And so again, as it described in previous verses, uh, they're going to be exposed. Uh, they're going to be brought to a place of truth. There will be no pretense, no covering. Uh, they will literally be barefoot and naked. And, uh, you know, that's how God deals with us you know in uh <clears throat> in the psalms it says that you know um he requires truth in the inward parts and so often god brings us to a place of absolute truth you know a, a place of brokenness where we can't deny who and, and what we literally are and in that place though of brokenness in that place of, of brokenness and truth that's when he can begin to work in us because we're not trying to hide ourselves. We're not trying to make excuses. We're not trying to, you know, pretend about anything. It's that place where God can really work in our hearts and they're going to be brought uh, to that place of no pretense, no covering. Uh, finally, now in verse 27, it says, I have seen your adulteries and, and your lustful names, the lewdness of your harlotry, your abominations on the hills and in the fields. Woe to you, O Jerusalem, Will you still not be made clean? And so they thought that they had their secret places, but nothing is secret before the Lord. They had their high places, their secret places. They even brought these, these things into the house of God. God had seen it all. Their unfaithfulness, their harlotry, their pride, their arrogance. And, and there's always that point where God in his righteousness actually has to deal with it. And we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Ultimately, God will deal with these things. Uh, similarly, uh, in Isaiah, in Isaiah 65, verse 7, it says, Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, who have burnt incense on the mountains and blasphemed me on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. That's just a real nice Bible way of saying what goes around comes around. And the things that you've done are going to come back full circle back to you. And I'm going to measure it back to you to your bosom, right back to your heart. And so God's going to deal with that. Then he says, woe to you, O Jerusalem, will you still not be made clean? Won't you be made clean? The offer is still there. Will you not be made clean? God's desire is that they would be. He's done his part. It's simply up to us now to make the right choice. And that's why you read it in the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they should be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God, sadly, will cleanse them, but it will be by fire. He says, will you not be made clean? God will do the cleaning, 
but they're not going to like the way he does it. And that's 100% avoidable. And as we get into the next chapter and the next chapter, it's pretty much a continuation uh, of the same thing, exhorting the people to uh, basically do the right thing. Father God, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for your love and for your kindness. Uh, thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and that you are a God of righteousness as well as a God of love. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to walk in your righteousness, to, to reflect your love back to you. Thank you, Father, for these, these awesome words. Uh, thank you, Lord, for instructing us tonight. <coughs> help us, Lord, to be pleasing in your sight. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's uh, stand together. We're going to close with uh, the benediction. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee, the Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. God bless you guys. I pray the Lord continues to minister to you. I like the part about how, you know, we can't clean ourselves up, but he'll clean us up that we were like that filthy rag that got buried by the river Euphrates, but he's redeemed us, he's washed us in his blood, and he's made us a new creature in Christ Jesus. Think about that for a while. That'll bless you. God bless you guys. Have a good night. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up.